From China to the world, digitalization is reshaping everything we know and driving the rapid rise of a new economy. As the leader in digital solutions, H3C endeavors to promote various industries to accelerate digital transformations via digital brain. By accelerating the construction of digital government, we help build new smart cities, promote government services, economic development, and people's well-being, make digital government easy to reach. Relying on the cloud and networks carrier business strategy, complete access, aggregation, core, backbone network routers equipment, and full domain cloud infrastructure, we are deeply involved in the construction of carriers 5G, IP networks, communication network clouds, and IT private cloud, facilitate carriers to fully achieve business transformation. Through the construction of education informatization, we help build digital brains to create smart campuses, enable teachers and students to enjoy the education revolution. With our digital information platform, we help build digital brains to promote the construction of smart healthcare, make smart medical treatment accessible to all. Through the intelligent digital platform, we help build a three-dimensional transportation system and promote smart travel in an all-around way, make smart transportation reach everywhere. With our digital financial architecture and full-stack cloud strategy, we provide financial institutions with full-stack products, solutions, and services to accelerate the digital transformation of our customers, get digital finance fully deployed. With our robust digital capabilities, we provide enterprises with comprehensive one-stop infrastructure services. Let enterprises accelerate their digital transformation. Through the end-to-end -end and full-stack digital innovation strength, we create an integrated digital platform for engineering buildings to fully release the value of data, make buildings smarter. Based on deep insights into industry needs and cutting edge technologies, we develop mature digital products and solutions to satisfy various application requirements, serving 900 million netizens with innovative services. Make the internet enter the era of 10 gigabit. The amazing digital achievements result from the strengths that have been accumulated for years. Rooted in China, we have two headquarters, seven R&D bases, over 50 sales and service offices. Serving the entire world, we have seven overseas branches and apply our products in nearly 100 countries. We take technical innovation as the core engine for growth we are dedicated to developing technologies with independent intellectual property rights. We actively explore new areas of technology for the future. We fully support the construction of global scientific and technological think tank. We are building an open and mutually beneficial digital ecosystem. We share innovative digital achievements with the world creating widespread digital success stories. We actively undertake corporate social responsibility, make digitalization more powerful, and make our society warmer. Integration empowers technology. Digital future has infinite value as it is shared by everybody. HCC is dedicated to providing comprehensive digital solutions that are based uh, on in-depth industry insight. In this way, we hope to help customers from all walks of life to accelerate digital transformations and business innovation, thus boosting the well-being and the happiness of people. Together with us, build a digital future for better lives. H3C, the leader in digital solutions.
Okay. Um, can everybody hear me? Um, yes, we can. Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, due to different time zones of our participants, um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, now is um, recording our... in progress. Okay, so uh, now is our um, the Monday's plenary. Uh, I'm Jie An from CERNET. I'm the chair of today's plenary. Uh, today we have three keynote speakers. Uh, two of them is uh, are the uh, pre-recorded uh, talks. And uh, the other is a live presentation online. So the first keynote speaker is Jeff Houston. The second one is uh, Professor Xueren Yang from Huawei. And then the third speaker is uh, Wei Jin Wen from H3C. So Jeff uh, is the first speaker. Jeff is the chief scientist at APNIC, uh, the uh, regional internet registry uh, serving the Asia Pacific region. He has been closely involved with the development of the internet for many years, particularly within Australia, where he lead the effort of the initial de uh, deployment of the internet in Australia from Australia academic and research sector. He has also worked for the largest Australian communications service provider, Telstra, in senior engineering, architecture, and research roles, assisting with the large scale deployment of the internet across Australia. And as a transit service provider in the Asia Pacific region, he is also author a number of internet related books and was a member of the Internet Architecture Board from 1999 until 2005, as well as chairing a number of working groups in the Internet Engineering Task Force. He served on the Board of Trustees of the Internet Society from 1992 until 2001, and served as the chair of the board in 1998 to 1999. IETF is the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is a large open international community of network designers, operators, vendors, and researchers concerned with the evolution of the internet architecture and the smooth operation of the internet. The mission of the IETF is to make the internet work better by producing high quality relevant technical documents that influence the way people design, use, and manage the internet. So today, Jeff is going to introduce more details about the ITF. So please, uh, Jeff, actually, he sent his apology to all participants today because he's on the flight right now. So he uh, recorded his presentation in advance. Now, uh, let's play his speech video. Hi, um, good morning, good afternoon, whatever. Um, my name is Jeff Houston. I'm the chief scientist at uh, the Asia Pacific Network Information Center. And uh, I can't actually be with you in person at the moment. Um, I think I'm on a plane, or will be. Uh, and although networking is is getting it better every day, um, doing one of these things remotely from a plane over the middle of the Pacific, nah, not going to happen. Um, so I'm recording this in advance. So I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, I was asked to speak today about the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, the IETF, and so I've prepared a few slides, and I'll wander into the slide pack. To, uh, a, because it helps me to talk uh, and sort of give some focus, and B, it might help you to actually understand what I'm saying at the same time. Um, so I'll, I'll 
wander over to the slides now and actually uh, share those and then um, let's bring up the right view and then launch. So uh, yes, this is actually talking about introducing the IETF and uh, what I'm going to talk about, uh, some bit of some background here about, you know, where does this come from and why? Uh, the emergence of the IETF from the networking soup of the 1980s. Uh, and then uh, talk about sort of kings and voting and running code and all those other things that the IETF holds dear one way or another. And uh, then uh, probably talk about today's IETF and, and offer an opinion or two. Um, so we'll do all that in about the next 30 minutes or so, if that's okay. Um, so where to begin? Where to begin? Um, me, I guess. Um, I've been doing this for a while. My first RFC encounter was actually uh, almost 40 years ago. Uh, I was working at the Australian National University and uh, all these Unix guys over in computer science were actually running this cool thing called Usenet News. Now, I was a systems programmer on a VAX VMS machine, if anyone remembers them, and uh, I was jealous. And about the only thing I could do about that was port the entire Usenet news system across from Unix into VAX. Possible. Uh, and what helped me, oddly enough, was a very handy little specification, uh, RFC 850, uh, which actually told me what I should be doing, uh, which was extremely helpful. And uh, that was my first encounter with the RFCs and actually trying to implement um, RFC 850 on a VAX VMS system. Um, a few years later, I set up the Australian Academic and Research Network for the university system and uh, went off to an IETF meeting uh, in, in the hardship uh, city of Honolulu uh, to talk about that experience in November 89. I've forgotten what number that was, 8th, 10th, something like that. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, at the end of July of this year, I attended the 114th meeting of the IETF. So they've had a fair few between then and now, uh, pretty regularly at at least three a year. And uh, I won't say that I've attended anywhere close to 114, but I think I'm closer to 100 than not. <laughs> Whoops. Um, that's a lot of ITF meetings. They tend to blur, believe me. Uh, I have authored or co-authored about 44 RFCs. I've done four working groups to, that I recall. Uh, I've chaired them or co-chaired them. And uh, I've been a member of the Internet Architecture Board for a six year stint around the uh, turn of the millennia from 99 until 2005, and was their general unpaid dog's body for four of those years as well, because, you know, someone had to do it. So I, I think in terms of introducing the IETF and where it came from, I've, I've certainly, uh, you know, donated at, at, at the Bud Bank in various times and places, and I'm certainly passingly familiar with the IETF in various guises. So. I'd, I'd certainly like to share some of that experience and outlook today. And in particular, because it's APAN, uh, talk about the interaction of the IETF with the research community and the role of research in this, this space. So let's kind of start close to the start as we can, which is sort of where did this whole digital data networking thing start? And um, it certainly is after telephony, it's after telegraphy, but it wasn't that much after. I mean, teletype machines evidently had a digital sort of signal encoding in the 1940s. And while a teletype machine is just a, a typewriter, it was certainly the start of this idea of mapping digital data through the telephone network. And um, the first of these true attempts to do this was the US Air Force uh, in the 1950s, uh, which had decided that what it was going to build uh, was a continentally sort of scaled air defense system. And they were going to build all these wonderful computers using vacuum tubes. Yes. Uh, wonderful computers to process all this data and, and understand where, where stuff was flying and why. Um, they actually completed it in 1962. And I understand it was only decommissioned in, in 1983, 20 years later. But I tell you what, you'd really hope that by 1983, they were doing something other than computers based on vacuum tubes. Yet you'd hope that at least the transistor had come along and hit the Air Force by then, but who knows? Interestingly, while 
governments and defense dominated computing in the 1940s and 50s uh, that was all blown away in the 1960s when commercials took over the comparison computers came down the needs of the commercial sector were enormous and one of the bigger networks that appeared in the 60s was actually the Sabre network the airline reservation system um, and, and there were many many others of various forms um, they didn't actually build their own network of course what they used was the margins of oversupply of the existing telephone network which at the time had been moving away from uh, frequency multiplexing frequency division multiplexing and moving into time switching uh, time-based switches and so all of a sudden you digitized voice you quantized it into streams or bits and then you simply switched those streams through effectively digital switches using time and so when someone wanted a digital circuit you could actually just peel off a voice circuit because uh, it was a digital circuit 64 kilobits per second and just hand it to the customer and and the customer would then connect their computers and it would certainly be an interesting issue now these were point to point which is fine if you've only got two computers but when you had 10 or 100 you've got to think about how you're going to use these point to point circuits to create a mini cloud where any computer can talk to any other computer and one of the ways of doing it was to actually pull apart the telephone circuit switching and actually think about the model of packet switching where all your computers connected into a common packet switch network and on the packets you actually label where the packet is to leave the network and let the network switch the packet directly from one computer to the other now there were a number of projects underway in a number of different countries in France uh, Louis Pouzon had worked on a system in Cyclades a research network that ultimately became I think the foundation uh, of the x25 network uh, but that wasn't the only effort at the National Physics Laboratory in the United Kingdom and of course in DARPA in the United States there was also this work on trying to understand instead of using time let's use packets instead of rely trying the clock to figure out where to switch packets put the information about where the packet's going in a separate part of the packet called the header let the packet tell the network how to cope with it these are powerful ideas and in fact that idea came as far as i can see uh, from original work in the uh, bell labs in the late 1950s as to where to go with time division switching and this whole idea of the packet becomes autonomous from the network was a fundamentally you know, good idea that built all this packet networking uh, the US in the early 1960s was a technology powerhouse they decided to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade and quite frankly <laughs> a lot had to be done between the early 1960s and the late in every area of technology if they were even going to have a hope and, and so there was a mad rush to train people to deploy them to to get them into this area of developing a whole bunch of technologies and communications was certainly part of it and so that's where we come from now the internet I think emerged in a more visible form as the internet uh, in a seminal paper published by Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn in May 1994 um, and what they've done was actually interesting because previous networks were top to bottom everything connected to the x25 network but what about the other networks well they can't interconnect that doesn't work like that everyone connects to my network but Vint and Bob's network was different because they said we're not going to make a network that everyone connects to quite the opposite we're going to leave you where you are you're connected to your network that's okay we're going to build gateways that link these networks together so now all we need is a small number of gateways we're not rebuilding anyone's network and we equip the end computers also with this IP protocol that before they pass their packet into the first network they wrap the data up with an internet protocol header that says this is stuff for all the gateways to listen to no one else and this is how you deliver my internet work packet to its ultimate destination so this idea of a network of networks was actually a very powerful idea 
and it had three consequences. Uh, the first was that this network of networks had its own properties, which wasn't the maximum of all the components. It was the minimum, the lowest common denominator. And the lowest common denominator of a network of networks is packets. And not even good packets, just packets. So packets could be locked, dropped without a trace. It was unreliable. Packets could be reordered. Packets could be duplicated. Anything you can do to a packet, mangling whatever, was fair game. The internet network didn't assume anything. As someone pointed out at the time, you could map the internet onto carrier pigeon. And it was a great joke. I think it was even a, a, a standard published on April 1 at one year. And we all were having a quiet chortle to ourselves until a group of mad Norwegians decided to implement it with real life pigeons. Um, and yes, it, it worked oddly enough. But the whole idea was datagrams was the lowest common denominator and actually stripped out all the distractive stuff about networking and got down to the essentials of what a packet was. The next one was actually adaptive fragmentation. How big should the packets be? Well, if you talk to someone who'd done uh, ATM, asynchronous transfer mode, they'd say packets, uh, 48 bytes of payload and seven bytes of header and it's fixed. Interesting. If you talk to an ethernet person, it was, oh, anything between 64 and 1500 octets, knock yourself out. Uh, someone doing FIDI rings, fiber distributed data interface rings, uh, anywhere up to 4,478 octets, whatever. So what happens in this network of networks when a really big packet coming off a FIDI ring hits an ATM network? Well, if it's ATM, the answer is disastrous, but that's probably a criticism of ATM. Let's call it Ethernet. My 4,000 octet packet hits an Ethernet. Well, you can't send 4,000 octets through an Ethernet. You have to slice and dice. And IP had slicing and dicing. The router that interconnected those two networks could actually take that, that packet, cut it up to match, and send the bits on, reproducing the IP header on every slice. And it was up to the machine, the IP machine, all the way at the other end to put it all back together again powerful concept we don't use it very much these days and in fact we frown on it but at the time it was what made the internet the internet it was the cut through and last and not least was this whole idea of stopping making networks too clever reliability performance flow control that's all a computer at the end problem don't make it a network in the middle problem you know it's a bit like talking in between you and i is just a bunch of compressed sound waves it's our brains that turn it into a conversation. End to end is what's happening in our heads, not in the audio waves. And oddly enough, this whole end to end architecture is actually an encapsulation of exactly the same thing. It may be a really, really unreliable, crappy datagram system, but with the right end to end control, which was termed TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol, you got reliable streams, adaptation, and enough power that that same protocol which was originally struggling to push a few kilobits through a network is now used to transfer petabits of data across these astonishingly big terabit sized fiber paths same architecture same design astonishingly powerful and and almost unprecedented in terms of technology design but i digress um what happened as well three things that changed the market completely one was almost inevitable moore's law was kicking in big computers were becoming small cheap computers and everyone had one instead of computer networks clustered around a single expensive mainframe there were lots of computers all talking to each other a diverse collection and so the network actually became more important than the mainframes than the computers and uh, i i point out digital equipment only because the PDP-11 sort of heralded this change where every lab had one of these devices. But there was a whole industry making smaller and cheaper computers, all the way through to Apple and IBM with their consumer device personal computers uh, that happened in the sort of you know, early 1980s as well. So, you know, this was inevitable. Secondly, was the battle of vendorware 
versus open sourceware. And interestingly, that was actually a regulatory action in the United States that took their telephone company and under an antitrust action, negotiated an agreement where AT&T, the dominant telco of the day, decided to basically slice itself up into a bunch of mid-level telephone companies. And they had some stranded assets as a result of that. And one of them was this Unix project that should be done in Bell Labs. And it was sort of an orphan because under the terms of their agreement, they weren't allowed to compete in, in computers. So here was a perfectly good operating system that they couldn't kind of convert into the AT&T environment. And so what they did was actually license it to universities as an open source, free to use tool. And the universities are kind of going, manna from heaven, love your work. Because here was a really good, cheap, portable operating system with source code that just worked. Um, and Unix revolutionized the environment. These days, when you look at the computing environment, there's Unix and there's nothing. It is everything. Um, and last but not least was a very astute contract from uh, ARPA, the uh, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, the contractor with the University of California, Berkeley, to actually write the Internet Protocol Suite uh, in C, what other language is there, um, and, and produce it as an open source bundle without any constraints as to who could use it, modify it or whatever. It had copyright, but the copyright basically said, here it is. Don't hold us liable because we're the government, so that doesn't work. Uh, use it at will. And all of a sudden, here was a cheap, open, open source piece of technology that ran on cheap, open source, non-proprietary operating systems that mapped all these mini computers into a working networking system from the word go. All the makings of a revolution, it happened because the vendorware couldn't keep up. But it wasn't quite the only show in town. There was another, um, the Open Systems Interconnection Protocol Suite that some of you might remember, OSI. It had very strong backing from the telephone companies, particularly in Europe, as well as some computer uh, vendors, uh, I think DEC was one of them, that really felt that this industry-wide effort was going to gain traction uh, because certainly the Europeans saw it as the next building block after X25. It kind of took the transmission and made it into a complete protocol suite. Um, it didn't gather much traction in the United States. The work was incomplete. The work was self-contradictory. Um, <laughs> there was much to be done and very little will to do it. And you sort of go, but why not? And I, I think the answer was a huge number of the folk working in this space in the United States had actually been working on the internet. And they kind of liked what they saw and were much more committed to make that work and work better than they were to jump ships into this rather odd committee structured OSI where the pace of work was glacial. The IETF started up. So that if you're working on the internet, you actually had a group and a tribe that you were a member of. And, and that was very powerful. Now, it happened because the US government was, was sort of having a success disaster problem. The more the internet got used, the more DARPA was on, or ARPA was on the hook to actually support the work, fund folk, you know, provide all the necessaries for this work. And quite frankly, this was an open-ended commitment that they didn't like. They needed to get out of there. They needed to broaden the support base, involve researchers and, and other bodies in industry to sustain it, and just quietly take a back seat at this point. And, and the Internet Engineering Task Force was the way in which they co-opted other people to work in that same effort. Because all the folk who came along, predominantly from the research community to start, had a lot in common. Being from the research community, money was scarce, so they wanted it cheap. They wanted it fully functional. It had to work like stuff you bought from the vendors, or better. They wanted a common open technology that could just scale up to astonishing levels. And they wanted to work across all platforms, not just the ones from DEC or IBM or anyone else. And so this common viewpoint and a common tribe without a leader, it was up to the people. And it naturally suited, I think, 
the environment of the United States at the time, which had this sort of loose, open research community, it was hungry for things to do at the same time. And so a natural marriage that really took off very, very quickly, that was the ITM. When it kind of found its feet and started to establish its, its pattern and working, it actually borrowed a lot of its values and way of working from the research community rather than from the corporate environment. This wasn't IBM's internet. It wasn't digital's internet or AT&T's or anyone else. If you came to an IETF meeting or joined an IETF mailing list, it was you as a person, not the corporate entity, not who employs you. We all participate even today in the IETF as individuals, you, me, and everyone else there. Now, interestingly, that actually translates into the material that the IETF produces. IETF documents have authors, like any other academic paper. They're created and attributed to individual, by and to individual authors and editors, not some anonymous committee or not, well, the authors state without saying who they are you are credited or, or damned by what you write in the IETF. Your name is there. And the IETF almost acts like a kind of editorial committee in some ways to try and get the best out of these specifications they possibly can through that kind of document shepherding process. But it's still your document. It's still you underneath it all. It's still your work. Uh, thirdly, it's open. It's really open. If you go to an IETF meeting, you might have to wear a badge. But what that badge says is when they bring out the cookies in the afternoon, uh, you're paid for your cookies. And if you haven't got a badge on, uh, you probably still have cookies, but folk might frown at you. But that's it. The rooms are open. It's open in every possible way that we can make it. There's no barrier to participation. There's no test to see what you know or don't know about the subject material. That's not the spirit of the IETF. Oddly enough, it is extraordinarily accessible in any way we possibly can. Unlike other standards bodies that charge to get a copy of the standard, because that's their only income, everything produced by the IETF is freely available. It's there. Use it as you wish. It's open. Um, the corollary in a lot of that is nothing's ever marked as finished. Nothing. Because almost like research. There's always more to think about, more to be done, more to be revised. Everything is a work in progress. It really is. Nothing is cast in final concrete. This is never going to change because that's silly. Of course, it's going to change. So everything is actually shiftable, can be questioned quite validly because like research, we're building up hypotheses about networking. We're not constructing the axioms that are fixed and unchanging. And last but not least, interestingly enough, there's no voting. Unlike many other standards bodies where the corporate members vote, I was in Telstra employed by them in Standards Australia. I wasn't a member of Standards Australia, Telstra was. So I was there in my role as employee and I voted with the Telstra voting card which is kind of silly in some ways, because in so many ways, good technology is not technology that wins a vote. It's technology that works. It's technology that actually is the best possible way of engineering based on what we know on the day. That's not a voting matter. That's actually a matter of professional judgment. That's almost an engineering matter. And the IETF came out at the front and said, that's what this is about. There's no voting, none of that. And it all became a T-shirt because the dress code of the IETF um, is, yes, dress is appreciated. The lack of, the lack of any clothing is, is less appreciated. But as to what you wear, eh, up to you. Um, and this came out on a T-shirt. This was the memorable IETF 83 in Paris. Um, wonderful social in, in a uh, museum in Paris. Beautiful. Um, but anyway, yes, uh, this was a a saying from Dave Clark of MIT, who was trying to encapsulate what the IETF was about. And it's kind of got to the heart of it in a few small words about saying this is not a top-down hierarchy. This is not about voting. This is not about enforcing my view on you. 
whoever I is, I am and you are. This is actually about all of us thinking, well, this is the best we can come up with collectively. What we called rough consensus, where if you'd asked any individual, it's, yeah, I can see why we got to that. Do you agree with it? Well, by and large, might quibble with details, but I'm there. And that's what rough consensus was all about. But the next bit, running code. The specification is good enough to actually produce code out of it. It's not just some idle thoughts that have never, ever been implemented. And that was almost a direct hit against OSI. OSI at one point was characterized by a person who tried to implement it, Marshall Rose, as a six foot high stack of paperware that described vaporware, stuff that never ran. Whereas the IETF was trying to build stuff that was indeed running code and the paper didn't matter, the running code did. And so this is really the true meaning of what running code is. A specification from the IETF is meant to provide a programmer, someone with you know competence in coding, enough information that if you use that spec, you can build code that works. And if someone else does the same thing, these two code artifacts will interoperate, that you can build a network of separately built components that fully interoperate as a result. That is what the IETF was trying to produce. And so the real specification, oddly enough, was the working code that interoperated. The words were there to guide those, into the, those implementations and interoperation. Now, the ITF specification is not intended to be solving all problems at all times. It doesn't. Never was meant to. It's a point problem that we scope the problem and solve that scope problem. Uh, equally, though, you're meant to be self-aware enough that in solving your problem, you don't make life harder for everyone else. You actually try and understand what else is out there and make sure you're not causing problems for everyone else. You know, be nice. Be nice. Um, and, and last and not least, it's meant to be open. It's not describing something that's owned by some other company or corporate entity. Well, that's not what it's meant to do. So if the IETF is considering alternate approaches and someone puts their hand up and says, well, actually, my company owns that approach, the IETF would tend to migrate to one that wasn't so incumbent. They would tend to use an option that is fully open and fully implementable without condition. If it's a forced choice that you've got to choose between one or another that have some degree of encumbrance, the IETF generally goes along the lines of freely available, non-discriminatory terms. Because for the IETF, openness is part of the answer. Everyone should be able to, to have access to this technology. It is not a luxury. It's not a secret. It's open. It's accessible. It's available. So that's what the ITF is trying to achieve, the way it achieves it, the structure of the grouping is probably worth just a, a, a quick mention, a touching mention. Um, there's a lot of people who are on IETF mailing lists and you go, well, how many people are members of the IETF? Well, that's actually not the right question. We don't know and we will probably never know. How many people are on IETF mailing lists, come to meetings, participate? Well, that's a bit easier and yeah, some thousands, precisely how many? Well, some thousands. Um, so there's a certain amount of organization of some thousand wayward folk. And so there are a number of groups inside the IETF to help us work together. Um, there's a, a corporate entity, the IETF LLC, uh, because we live in a real world. And when you do things, you need to be some kind of corporate entity. Oddly enough, it's the amusingly phrased single member disregarded entity of the Internet Society. Which I think means we're a subsidiary of somebody else, but we can do what we want. I guess. <laughs> um, there's also a trust because because intellectual property rights, I guess, you know, someone has to be the holder of some of this stuff. And, and the trust certainly is that vehicle that protects the IETF's collective interest in saying these are materials that the IETF produced in conjunction with the individuals that actually authored the standards. So that's the background. In the foreground uh, are two more groups, the Internet Architecture Board, uh, which I was on for six years, uh, a committee that has some degree of oversight, 
if you could call herding cats an oversight role, that's oversight. Um, <laughs> it tries to do more from time to time and then gives up. Uh, it liaises with a whole bunch of other standards groups, or at least nominates the folk who are liaisons, collects reports. Uh, it has some procedural roles, particularly in appeals and disputes, and some degree of advisory role. Um, and in their very, very spare time, because these are all volunteers and no one gets paid to be on the IAB, in their very, very spare time, uh, they might organise an architectural workshop or two uh, if they're lucky. And, and they might even get to write a report uh, if they're even luckier with time juggling. Um, but nevertheless, a, an important body in, in the scheme of things to help the rest of us kind of, you know, proceed onward uh, without having our time sucked away by doing liaisons, procedures, advisories, etc. Um, the true work of standards, though, is actually managed by a separate group, uh, collectively known as the steering group, the Internet Engineering Steering Group. We organise the IETF into these things called areas, routing, transport, internet, security, and, and so on, um, operations and management. And, and those areas, which are actually a collection of working groups, are headed by uh, two area directors who get the final say on some of the procedures. Should we form a working group? Is the charter appropriate, et cetera, are done by these area directors. And all the area directors collectively uh, meet pretty regularly, constantly, um, as the Internet Engineering Standards Group, a steering group, to actually oversee the activity of the ITF and, <laughs> and I'm not sure if they really knew what they were putting themselves into, act as the final editorial reviewer of every single RFC, every one that ever gets published, goes through the IESG washing machine. And it's so much work. I, I'm in awe of the amount of time these area directors spend in reviewing all of these documents. Um, somehow, the rest of us think, I don't need to worry about the quality of my document. The IESG will make it all better. And so, yes, by doing such a good job, we all rely on them more and more. Um, there's a lesson there somewhere, and I don't know what it is. Uh, <laughs> and last but not least, the working groups, which they do the work that the IESG isn't going to do for them for free, uh, which is kind of developing the spec to the point at which it gets the level there, the working group's sick of it, and they throw it to the IESG to solve all the rest of the problems in it. The work, though, realistically and seriously, does happen in the working groups. And the work of the working groups, as anyone would tell you, happens on the mailing lists. So. It's the mailing lists in the working group where things happen in the ITF. The meetings, less so. The mailing lists, more so. They're very important. Um, but I'm speaking to APAN, which is more like the research folk. And, and quite frankly, just as importantly, there's an acknowledgement in, in the internet that this has only barely begun. This is certainly unfinished and we don't know what we're doing. We really don't. We're learning how to do it well. We're learning about scale. We're learning about security. <laughs> the world's worst teachers, uh, the folk who are attacking us all the time. And we're learning how not to blow it up, you know, how to make sure that billions of users all the time can actually have an internet they can count on. And, and so we don't know what we're doing. And a lot of this is actually a research issue. And so we've always been highly engaged with the research community. We need some insights as to what we could be doing and why. What should we be focusing on? Where is there areas which are productive? And this is in the IETF parlance, the Internet Research Task Force. Now, unlike other research coordination agencies, the IRTF has no money, none. Uh, we don't commission research. No, 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 no. That's other people's problem. We don't fund research. That's other people's problem. But we help researchers talk to their peers who share common interests. And these research groups are actually all about investigating topics that are, you know, have some commonality with others. Some are academics. Some are normal ITF members that work inside companies. Some are engineers. There's all kinds of folk in the research groups. And that's quite deliberate. Very, very open. Again, you join the research group by inclination, not by invitation or by any other qualification. It's up to you if you want to play in this. And uh, realistically, the IRTF produces reports. They don't produce standards. That's not their job. 
if standards are required and the IIRTF group feels really strong in this research group, there should be a standard, well, that advice is thrown over to the IETF. Hey, let's do a working group. Let's do something about this. I think we know what we need to do. The IRTF and the research groups don't take it that far. They're more just looking around at the landscape and trying to figure out what's useful to do. So let's go back to standards for a second. Why? Why do we need this? Because you see, previously in the telephone world, it was a command economy. Oddly enough, standards were not that important. You did things because the telephone company told you to do it. You built them according to a certain standard because that was the telephone company's view of what they wanted to build. And so everyone was orchestrated by the telephone company. All those various suppliers just simply worked at the telephone company's bidding. In a deregulated economy where there's no one in charge, all of a sudden the orchestrator is the market itself. And standards are actually intended to support that because they're the neutral arbitrator between producer and consumer. I want a widget that does X. What do you mean X? RFC 23. And the, the consumer says, you know, against the producer, supply me with a widget that does RFC 23 or whatever it is. And so it's this independent point where producers and consumers can have some assurance that they're talking about the same thing, that this standard specification actually describes an artifact or a technology that they both agree on is being exchanged in the market. It's the orchestrator itself of the market. So standards are important. The IETF is fundamental to the internet. So perfect? Nah. Lots of things have gone wrong over the years and probably still will. Um, network address translators. The IETF decided that they were evil and abomination, that they destroyed the end-to-end -end principle and we should never standardize them. So they didn't. And all of a sudden, folk producing NATs had no guidance. And so every NAT was different. And folk producing software to traverse NATs were ripping their hair out because there was no standard and every NAT behaved differently. In the absence of standards, the industry just falls apart. You'd even argue IPv6 was a bit of a failure. Um, it was produced at just the wrong time and solved a 1980s problem using 1990s technology. But the problem didn't really face because of NATs until very, very recently. And it's just not clear this is what we want today. Um, and I actually regard this as being a timing issue. Standards need to come at the right time, not too early, certainly not too late, but at the right time. If you're too early, they haven't got relevance when they're needed. Uh, security is when you don't have standards at all. Whoops. Uh, and, and we all thought we were all nice to each other. Why do we need to worry about hostile actors? And, and now we're, we're, we are the world's internet, the world's communication. And, you know, there is this horrible reality that not everyone is nice to each other. And some people are just downright hostile. And the internet needs to harden itself up. But it's already been deployed. It's already been standardized. We have to retrofit security. And that's difficult. Um, I'm not sure we're really doing enough with the research community. The IRTF is a fine effort, but is it really making the contacts it needs or is that contact point weak and loose and very, very small? Uh, we should be doing better. It's hard to say how or why, particularly as we're not offering free money. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it's a failure about the extent to which we're getting fertilization. And, and of course, it's always easier to have the conversations we're confident in and very, very hard to have the conversations that no one understands what we're talking about. And, and current networking needs, which is actually all about futures, is a really hard conversation. Whereas fixing up the problems of last month, last year, the last decade is phenomenally easy because everyone's an expert about the far past because it's already happened. It's very hard to get focus and accuracy on a conversation about the future. So that last one is perhaps the biggest stretch goal that the ITF has had a very mixed ability to actually be predictive in the way it standardizes technology. As a case in point, we got mobility so wrong. There's IPv4, mobile IP. There's mobile IPv6. The world of mobility with its billions of providers, consumers, uses none of these standards. It has an entirely 
different model. The IETF, for all the work that it did, solved nothing. So failures. On the other hand, there are successes to celebrate. Oh my God, it's open. It is really open without qualification. You participate, you contribute any way you want. And that's been a success. The ITF is incredibly accessible. We debate the idea and not the person. And occasionally the debates get inflammatory and it's kind of calm down and remind yourself, it's not about the people, it's about the idea. There's been a huge amount of effort to try and make sure that folk join the IETF early in their careers and can participate and be acknowledged from the word go. The future leadership is already in today's working groups and that's great. Um, it's willing and ready to adapt and change. We're not teaching folk how to sort of play by the IETF way. We're trying to understand what the right way to play is each time. So it is trying to constantly change and adapt. And a recognition that perfection isn't achievable. Go for useful, aim lower and get it right. Don't disturb everyone else, don't be harmful, but in fact, be humble. Just make sure that you do the best job you can without claiming anything larger than that. Things will change. Right today may well be wrong tomorrow. Write your RFC as best you can and acknowledge that a few years down the track, someone might write another RFC to say, you know that earlier one? Didn't work. That's okay. Be humble about this and actually say, we're striving to make it work, not to sort of reach eternal axioms that are unchallengeable. And what are our challenges? Well, like any other group in this rapidly changing technology world, renewal, how to keep on changing, how to not get stuck in habits of the past, how to make sure we're relevant as the world moves up the protocol stack, that the new world is all about applications and content and streaming and not about packets and packet networking. What's our contribution into that space? And what's our sustainability as we constantly change who has money and why and how does the IETF manage to feed and fuel and buy all those hungry people at meetings, all those cookies that we clearly devour? Hopefully that gives you a picture of where and why the IETF is at today. Again, my apologies in not being able to be with you right now, but I hope you found this at least entertaining. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks, Jeff. Uh, even he's not online with us, but I'd like to express my thanks to him. And uh, Jeff shared many interesting stories of the early days of the ATF and the internet. And also uh, he shared uh, how ATF works and his related organizations and even the failures. He also, um, uh, trying to tell us how to participate the ITF activities. So for us, um, I believe we know the ITF activities is very important for the international, for the global internet development. So not only for Asia Pacific. So it is very important to us. Even for us, um, we are not, uh, I mean, those uh, APAN researchers, uh, APEN uh, engineers and um, not in the internet fields, but we could share our needs with the ITF working groups. It will be helpful for us to make the internet better. So if you're interested <coughs> in more, you could find Jeff's website. I will share that here. And also his APNIC blog. If we are really interested in more and to meet Jeff in person, we could invite Jeff to our uh, physical APAN meeting in the future. Okay, thank you. And our next speaker is from Huawei, Dr. Xueren Yang. He is the Huawei's enterprise router president. Uh, Dr. Yang joined Huawei in 2006 and currently he serves as vice president of Huawei's data communication product line and the router field. He has been engaged in the basic design and development of routers for eight years and market development for five years. 
currently he is responsible for the end-to-end -end de development and management of products and solutions in the field of enterprise routers. Today, Dr. Yang will talk about the tech innovation lead network into intelligent era. So Dr. Yang, I leave the floor to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you, can you see my screen now? Yes, I can see that. Uh, yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is Snow. Uh, thank you for your <coughs> time. So today my topic is the tech innovation list IP network into the intelligence years. So uh, firstly, let's look at the, uh, the role of IP network during the digital world. So from the service of view, we can see that there is a lot of new services like MyPA, Smart Manufacturing, and five lights like lights. And uh, the other things, there is a lot of can, uh, connections like the customers, uh, homes, business, any kind of things you want to connect to the world. So what is the role of IP network in this, uh, in, in this system? So we, we, we define it as IP, is above the connections and below the applications. So we think for the intelligent IP network uh, networks, it will be the bridge of the digital world. Uh, let's just look back the history of the IP networks. Uh, if from the gener uh, generation level, is uh, the first generation of IP network, it's internet IP, it's just the focus on connections. And the second level is uh, all IP network. It will be going to the IP connect to the internet of things. And for the next generation, it will be connect everything we can imagine uh, uh, for our networks. So previously, uh, when we uh, just look at the network architecture, we just mostly, uh, uh, mostly we just uh, focus on the bandwidth, experience, and operation maintenance. Is it not? The answer is no. So at the next generation, we define there is a six technical directions for the future-oriented IP networks. Art of brand, security, energy saving, awareness, deterministics, and intelligence. So there is some key innovations we are doing uh, in our products and the solutions. So first of all, let's just uh, look at the ultra brand. Our target, our target is to build an ultra brand hardware platform for the future networks. So there is a fundamental techno technologies. It's called high speed data bus in our equipment. So now the speed we are using widely used now is. 28 gigabits. And uh, there are some high end routers and equipment we are using six, uh, 56 gig, uh, gigabit. For the next, uh, for the next steps, what we are doing is we will be developed, development at 100 gig, <clears throat> uh, high speed device. And for the next one, we will be uh, development development to 200 gigabits. So from the interface level, now we are researching is uh, we we can use the optical modular as 200 gig by directions optical modular, and we are also cooperate with some customers. Uh, we we do the researching in the one terabit interface now. And from the board level, we are widely used is one terabit line cards now. And uh, uh, there is a few, few customers that are using four terabits. Uh, for we are, what we are under development is uh, 70, 70, uh, 7 7.2 terabit line card now. And for the future, we are, will be launched 10 terabit line cards just uh, two, two years. <clears throat> there will be commercial years. And, uh, and for the Chinese level, we will be launched one, 
1.2 terabit traces. Okay, so it means the art of run is the basement technologies uh, for, for, the, for the network architecture. And the other thing is secure, security. So our, my opinion is security is the most important thing when we define our new solutions. So we, we integrate it with our products and solutions uh, in the security designs. Uh, from the technical view, uh, the connect connection, there is a connection, devices, and service level. Connections level, what we are doing now is we call it X, X, X site. Uh, it's, it's just uh, focused on the culture inclusion that's uh, uh, involved in our networks. And for the link level, the optical links also do the security technology now. From the device level, the AI power intelligent attack defenses is the key technologies we are doing now. And the, uh, the other thing is thematic inclusion algorithm. <clears throat> For the service level, uh, we are uh, busy with the technical in in innovation at optical inclusion. It means at the physical, optical physical level, it will be give us some capabilities at uh, securities. Uh, the other thing is energy receiving. So when we think about energy receiving, we usually should, should uh, balance with the low power consumption, high performance, and the high reliability. So previously, uh, when we doing the 100 gig interface board, the energy efficiency is just uh, uh, 1.6 silent gross gigabit. But as the one terabit land cars, we can achieve 0 0.5. But for the future, 10 plus terabits land cars will be achieved 0 0.1 volts per gigabit. So from the, from the equipment and network, also the carrier level energy savings, we also have some key technologies. For example, the equipment levels, when we involve in the uh, defense, we should involve the, the newest defense technology, which can reduce our noise, also reduce the power consumptions. And then when we design the chip site, we involve some uh, dynamic frequency and dynamic voltage adjustment technologies for low power design. For the network, network level, uh, we, with Designed some nodes that's a redundancy spare parts going to the energy saving mode. And also, we involve some new uh, manufacturing technologies for the chip side to reduce the power consumption. And for the carrier, carrier level, uh, we will be thinking about the whole network. We've been going to the idle or sleeping working status. So, this is the uh, uh, just uh, like the three stage. What? Well, we discuss the energy thing. Otherwise, it's awareness. It's just based on the protocols. Okay. It seems Dr. Yang, he has some network problems. Let's wait for one or two more minutes to see if he could come back with us.
Okay. It seems we lost Dr. Yang. Let's be patient for one more minute. Hello? Oh, yes, Dr. Yang, I can hear you. Yes, uh, sorry, sorry, not will be sure, so. Now it's good, now it's okay, right? Uh, yes, so, now, yeah, we can, we can hear you. So uh, uh, please go ahead. Uh, is this uh, the page of awareness? Uh, mm, we, cannot, we cannot see your screen. Could you share okay, your screen? Right, now. Okay. So you got it? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So awareness, uh, is this of the, the, the slides as awareness? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, okay. Please go ahead. Okay. So uh, at our awareness segment, uh, <clears throat> previously we just uh, focused on the channel awareness. Uh, just for example, the PIN, uh, the transient technologies, just focus on the channel awareness. And uh, the latest ones, we are focused on the flow awareness. It can give us some uh, service level SRAs or service. And uh, the accuracy, the accuracy is can achieved 10 minus six, but is it not? No. So the, the, the new, Technology, we just uh, using some just APN basics. We focus on the application level awareness. And with this, we can give the, each application have some dedicated uh, service assur assurance, like uh, SRA, like uh, high throughput or zero packet, like lights. So, and the, uh, the other thing is deterministic. It's including the deterministic latency, uh, bandwidth resource, and the deterministic pass. So the, there is a lot of challenge for the latest network. For example, uh, the cloud-based PRC, this is the newest uh, scenario in the manufacturing industry. Uh, if you want to uh, using this kind of uh, new technology, you must have the your jitter should be less than 30 million seconds, uh, 30 microseconds, and high, higher availability. So how can we achieve this kind of uh, requirement from the industry internet? Uh, so we, we defined there is a three uh, deterministics we should focus on. The first one is uh, determines latency, and there is some new technologies here. We call it periodic sharing and network calculus uh, application level slicing network. So slicing is very important. So because you know the latest network is combined the uh, IT and OT network together. So but OT network OT network is very very critical as uh, uh, network uh, parameters like latency. And uh, also there is a, a component level slicing uh, for the whole network. <clears throat> this is the deterministic requirement from the latest uh, uh, network scenarios. And then the other things, the, the last one is the intelligent. So why we our intelligent uh, technology solutions, including network digital mic, uh, network simulation, a knowledge graph and the uh, uh, AI operation system. So we combine, we combine these three kind of solutions. Well, our target is give the customers is uh, experience like zero reach, zero failure, or zero touch. Uh, from the operation network operation of view, we can achieve self configuration and self heralding and self organization. So combine all of these functions, we can achieve, we call it ABN, 
level four. It's auto autonomous driven network. Okay. Oh, I, ju uh, I just uh, introduced uh, there is three uh, technology directions, uh, outer broadband, energy receiving, deterministic security, awareness, and intelligence. So Huawei's Cloud One version three solutions, we continuously involved based on these six technology directions. Uh, our latest net engine 8,000 series routers will be support all the features we, uh, we, we, we I mentioned before. So we, we believe we can help our customers like uh, educations, uh, the internet service providers or public services, transportation, finance, and uh, energy industries. We achieve together to forward to the uh, digital world. Uh, we also uh, uh, you can invite all the uh, experts and uh, from the university, from the institution uh, uh, organizations. The, these experts can give us a lot of uh, technology advice. Yeah, thank you. That, that's all. Thank you very much, Dr. Yang. And um, because Doug Young is online, do you have any questions? If no questions, um, you could find Huawei and uh, you meet. You could meet Huawei uh, tomorrow. The meeting room uh, will be arranged during. 12.30 to 1.30. So thank you, Dr. Yang, again. OK, thank you. Thank you. And uh, the third speaker is uh, Wei Zhen Wen. He is the chief strategy architect of the technology strategy department at H3C. He has been working at H3C for more than 18 years. Today. Um, he will talk about H3C advanced network technology innovation. So H3C is a leader in digital solutions. As a core enterprise of Tsinghua Uni Group, H3C has continuously improved the level of digitalization and intelligent empowerment by deeply laying out the whole industry chain of cheap cloud net edge endpoint. H3C keeps up uh, with the uh, development trend of new generation information technology and makes a comprehensive layout of all forward looking technologies. So today's talk will focus on the network technology innovations. So please play the video. His talk is pre-recorded. Hello, everybody. Great pleasure to attend the meeting. I am a senior architect from H3C. Now, I work at the technology strategy department of H3C. Today, my topic is H3C Advanced Network Technology Innovation. As a leader in digital solutions, H3C is committed to becoming the most trusted partner of customers in terms of business innovation and digital transformation. As a core enterprise of King Ionic Group, H3C has continuously improved the level of digitalization and intelligent empowerment by deeply laying out the whole industry chain of cheap, cloud, net, edge, and endpoints. H3C has a full range of digital infrastructure capabilities, including chips, computing, storage, network, 5G, security, terminals, etc. It provides one-stop digital solutions, including cloud computing, big data, artificial intelligence, industrial internet, information security, intelligent connectivity, AI vision, edge computing, etc as well as end-to-end -end technical services. 
H3C keeps up with the development trend of new generation information technology and makes a comprehensive layout of forward-looking technologies, especially in the field of network. H3C is conducting technical research and developing products and solutions for the following key technologies, including the domestic network, in-network computing, computing force network, privacy computing, source address validation, all-in-one network, space earth integration network, IPv6+, plus, and so on, in conjunction with future network technology development and industrial digital transformation. Next, I will briefly talk about five subjects. The domestic network, in-network computing, computing force network, privacy computing, and the source address validation. First, let's have a look at the domestic network. In the process of evolving from consumer internet to industrial internet, scenarios such as internet of vehicles, telemedicine, industrial internet, etc. are emerging. One common feature of these scenarios is that they all contain a set of highly collaborative business control systems. The underlying logic is that they all involve interactions with high real-time business. Dynamistic network is a network that can provide highly dynamistic transition services for high real-time flows, transforming from traditional best app forwarding to on-time and accurate dynamistic forwarding, whose key features are low jitter, low latency, and low packet loss rates. H3C has end-to-end -end solutions in dynamistic network including various scenarios such as wired, wireless, access, aggregation, and core. HSVC is the equipment provider for the first dynamistic network in the world, which was built in Shandong province in China last year. The growth of computing force over the past five years has far outpaced the growth of network boundaries and the network communication capacity has gradually become a bottleneck for HPC and AI distributed computing. The total volume of communication data of distributed computing grows with the scale of distributed computing clusters, but the computing efficiency of clusters cannot grow linearly with the cluster size due to the limitation of network communication capacity and even decreases in class instead of rising. Internet commuting offloads the operation of aggregate communication of AI and AI distributed computing to network devices, allowing network devices to participate in computing, reduce message interactions between computing nodes, shortening communication latency, optimizing communication models, improving network bandwidth utilization efficiency, and accelerating AI and AI distributed computing. H3C actively invests in in-network computing research and launches programmable switches supporting in-network computing. Computing Force Network helps the cloud network to collaborate efficiently, reduce operational costs, and improve customer experience. Following the industry trend of computing force network as core productivity and the technology trend of computing network integration, H3C researches the underlying technology of CFN, help customers reduce cost and increase efficiency to comprehensively improve CFN capability from resources, services, cost, and user experience. In the evolution of CFN path, we will gradually move from centralized stage to distributed stage and then to the last stage, super computing network brain. We adopt distributed computing network brain and coordinate the network factor and the computing factor with multi-dimensional attributes to provide the best cost-effective services and improve experience for our customers. The full list of data value depends on the full integration of data 
and the private computing as a key technology to ensure that data is available but not visible, provides a solid technical guarantee for the integration of data circulation across data subjects. Private computing has encountered many problems in the implementation practice, and the most prominent one is performance. Compared to plain text computing, the encryption algorithm of private computing has more steps in the computation process, and its computation and I.O. communications increase its potentially. As SLC closely follows the development of domestic and international private computing technology in view of the performance problems encountered in the commercialization of private computing in China during the past two years. SVC has cooperated with partners to create end-to-end -end private computing solutions and all-in-one products and is committed to breaking the bottleneck and promoting the commercial implementation of privacy computing. In IPv6 networks, the source address solution is used to implement source address authenticity verification to block source address counterfeiting and enhance the security of IPv6 networks. The source address validation solution supports hierarchical deployment and provides systematic security protection and different scopes, including three main areas. The first one is access SIV. The authenticity of the source address is accurately verified by binding the access source IP, user information, and access network device port. The second one is intradomain SIV. To compensate for the inaccuracy of user loading information alone, SIV table entries are generated by restoring the true forwarding path. The last one is interdomain SIV. It explores multiple SIV approaches for large scale and heterogeneous cross domain verification. Network technology innovation has a long way to go. As a leader in network market, H3C is willing to work together with the partners to carry out in-depth cooperation in technical directions such as dynamistic network, in-network computing, source address validation to jointly build an advanced network system. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. This is the end of uh, talk uh, by uh, Dr. Wen. So, um, H3C is the platinum sponsor of this APAN meeting, and Huawei is a gold sponsor. So, uh, we also have the other three sponsors. You could find more information at our virtual exhibition hall. That's very fantastic thing. So um, thank you all very much for participating in this plenary and goodbye. Thank you.